the exciting, wonderful world of Pokemon. Pokemon was for many of us the first franchise we ever got into. There were toys, games, a Saturday morning TV show that brought joy to the weekend, and a pretty brutal manga? <coughs> Pokemon Adventures, or Pokemon Special in Japan, is an ongoing manga series that started its first run one month before the anime had ever been released in Japan. Yet, despite all my love for the Pokemon franchise, I own nearly every game, I collect the cards, plushies, the goddamn tattoo on my wrist, and more importantly, the manga coming first, I hadn't even heard about it until we entered the 2010s. I can't remember in exactly what context I heard about it, but I definitely remember it having something to do with this Arbok literally chopped in half. In my personal opinion, Pokemon Adventures is the Pokemon franchise's best kept secret. While the anime was originally a loose adaptation of the games, which has slowly evolved into its own thing, Pokemon Adventures is a direct representation of the games brought to life through drawings with just so much more added to it. At its base, it's the story of Red, a trainer from Pallet Town who's battling through the gyms and collecting data in the Pokedex for Professor Oak in hopes of becoming the best Pokemon trainer ever. He has Blue and Green as rivals and Team Rocket rearing its ugly head to cause trouble. But underneath the familiar story we all know, there's conversations about ethics and morals with well fleshed out characters who overcome genuine life and death circumstances. What's up beautiful people, this is Strawberry Tofu, and I know that you've probably heard opinions and reviews on the Pokemon Adventures manga before, but I've noticed that a lot of those are just around the first series. But this manga is ongoing, they're literally still releasing Sword and Shield at the moment. And so my plan is to start releasing retrospectives on a roughly monthly basis until all of them are covered. So make sure you hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so that you know when the next instalment gets released. Pokemon Adventures started as a monthly comic book in Japan in September 1999, with the last issue being released in late 2002. It was started in a time when the internet had only been available to the public for eight years. Britney Spears and Steps ruled the charts, and everyone was worried about the millennium bug that was meant to be the biggest computer virus we'd ever seen. Illustrated by Marto and written by Hidenori Kusaka, a name that I genuinely struggled to find any information on before Pokemon Adventures, the writer himself states that the series is influenced by his love of the video games. He wanted to portray in visuals the surprise and wonder that one feels when playing the Pokemon games. He used the manga to explore the questions he had while playing the games, like maybe this Pokemon lives in a place like this, or maybe this Pokemon's attacks look like that. And while at a quick glance this is satisfying to see, he does this in such depth that any Pokemon fan will be satisfied. Many of my own personal questions about how game mechanics would work in real life have been answered after reading this. Checking Pikachu's emotions, evolution through trading, and explaining how the gym badges work were all moments of, oh, that makes sense. If we take the gym badges as an example, we all know that gym badges allow Pokemon up to a certain level to obey your commands. But the manga explains that it isn't a single badge that has the power, but the accumulation of them that makes them work. The more badges you have, the more powerful signal they emit together. Pokemon then sense this power level, and so the really strong Pokemon will only listen to the powerful trainers who emit this signal. Similarly, you may have asked yourself the question, if it can affect Pokemon like this, then could this power be manipulated to affect humans? When all the badges are gathered in a specific machine invented by Team Rocket, they have the power to genuinely control all Pokemon that they wish to, providing that the Pokemon are wearing a special band. Place that band on a human, and it will do the same thing. In the later issues, Bruno from the Elite Four reveals how he's been struggling with memory loss because of said bands put on him. I had always assumed the chunky accessories around Bruno's ankles were some sort of Rock Lee-like training thing, but obviously not. As someone brought up with the Pokemon anime, a story that is renowned for not feeling like it needs to explain things to fans and leaves it to the message boards of Reddit to decipher how certain storylines happen, questions like, where the hell did Gary get those badges from? And what steroids is that Dragonite taking? This telling of the games is a breath of fresh air. It's visually beautiful, fast paced, and yet in depth in its explanations of how the Pokemon world and technology works. The constant threat of actual life or death keeps you on your toes while it explores some very real issues surrounding how the human species is damaging the planet using characters who, while they already feel familiar because of the games, we get to explore the personalities of on a whole new level. The storyline plays out like a two-part mystery, where you constantly find yourself asking questions that do actually get answered later. 
In fact, the notes I made while reading it are a perfect example just through the amount of question marks. Please excuse the handwriting. I didn't expect to be showing anybody these. Please don't judge me. But let's rewind back to the beginning. The first series of Pokemon Adventures is split into seven volumes and two parts, the red chapters and the yellow chapters. In the red chapters, we're introduced to red, obviously. An already Pokemon trainer, because in this world you don't have to be 10 to get your first Pokemon, who one day while helping some other kids in Pallet Town catch their first Pokemon, bumps into some shady characters, all dressed in black, bars on their chests, cough cough, wonder who that could be, who are trying to find a phantom Pokemon. Determined to be... I'm sorry, I couldn't resist that. He sets out to try and catch said Pokemon before our friendly chaps in black do. While stumbling through the forest, he happens across a fellow trainer fighting an incredible battle against a Pokemon he doesn't recognise. So obviously, he jumps in to try and take the win for himself. He's miserably beaten, the phantom Pokemon vanishes, and he's left with this rather sarky, spiky-haired guy giving him advice he doesn't want. Determined to improve himself, he visits Professor Oak, a local weirdo that people say knows a lot about Pokemon. However, upon entering the lab, he's taken by surprise when Oak appears and our hero accidentally releases all the Pokemon Oak had hanging around in Pokeballs. He vows to get the Pokemon back and the two set out to do just that. All seems to go pretty swiftly until capturing the last one, Bulbasaur, who not only is reluctant to come back, physically tackling Professor Oak in the gut to avoid such circumstances, but who also runs into a wild Machoke while running away. And it's only from the help of Red giving little Bulba access to sunlight that he's able to pull off an impressive solar beam to get them all away to safety. Impressed by our trainer's obvious natural skill, he literally didn't know Bulbasaur could use solar beam, he just guessed the plant would be able to use sunlight in some way, because science. And kindness towards Pokemon, Oak gives Red the Bulbasaur and a Pokedex as a reward, telling him, by the time you've input the data of all of the Pokemon, you'll be one of the great trainers and points him in the direction of Viridian Forest to start his quest. From here, we get a pretty familiar storyline. He meets Blue again, discovering that he's in fact the Professor's grandson and he is too on the same quest, making them rivals. He catches a pretty stubborn Pikachu. Bear in mind, this was released before the anime. He befriends the gym leaders and learns that if you can defeat them, they'll give you a badge, both making your current Pokemon more powerful and enabling you to catch more powerful Pokemon. But it's truly in the details that make for some thrilling storytelling. Physical violence towards people is an option in this world. In just the beginning storyline we've already mentioned, Red literally goes to punch Blue in the face, only for his fist to be caught mid-air. Pikachu fully electrocutes normal town people, not just our protagonist, and even good old Oak takes that tackle from the Bulbasaur. And this is just the first 50 pages. We're literally on chapter four. And this violence does escalate as the series goes on and the threats become bigger, but we'll get to that later. And there are so many other details that make for a captivating journey. We can see Pokemon in their Pokeballs and trainers can interact with them while they're in there. Pokemon centers aren't always open. If a Pokemon is made up of smaller objects, they can come apart. You can blow up an Onyx or unscrew a Magneton. And how Pokemon moves interact with each other is based in science. Heat rises, and this can be used to a Pokemon who's weak to fire's advantage. Pokemon that you pictured being large as a kid are actually large and intimidating. And our characters have traits based on trauma, and honestly, these are just the aspects I love that I can pluck from my brain while writing this. As Red continues his adventures through the Pokemon world, he discovers that Team Rocket are, in as much brief summary as I can give, scientifically experimenting on Pokemon so that they can control the most powerful Pokemon. They're trying to merge them, create new ones, and in their wake, they're leaving disturbed beasts that are attacking humans just because they don't trust us anymore. They nearly kill an Eevee. And if that isn't sacrilegious, I don't know why it is. We meet Green, a mischievous girl who was kidnapped by an unknown flying Pokemon when she was young and left a fem for herself. Jealous of our hero and his rival, as another child of Pallet Town, she kidnaps the Squirtle and a Pokedex and sets off on her own journey in hopes of fulfillment and solving the mystery of her past. Knowing it has something to do with Team Rocket, she ends up joining our heroes because her own motivations just so happen to align with Reds and Blues. We discover that over half the gym leaders actually work for Team Rocket too, and in due course, they capture the legendary birds, making Team Rocket's forces actually formidable. We actually have a competent Team Rocket here. And of course, in the end, it takes our trio working together with the good gym leaders, yes, that's what they name themselves, to stop Team Rocket's plans. 
Upon victory and a calmer Kanto region, they all enter the Pokemon League and battle it out for who's number one, with Red obviously coming out on top. And this is just the first three volumes. I found myself coming to the end of chapter three wondering where can we possibly go from here? Despite the violence, the threat of death, and even Pokemon zombies, everything we've been through so far has been your fairly standard overarching Pokemon story. What more could there possibly be left to explore? In fact, the only thing that let me know there was more story coming and that I should buy the next volume was the to be continued at the end of volume three. Flash forward two years and Oak is getting pretty worried that he hasn't seen Red since he got a letter of challenge from a bloke called Bruno. Yes, of the Elite Four, but Oak doesn't know that yet. While venting his worries to Misty, a heavily damaged Pikachu comes through the door without Red and the mystery of where the f is our favorite protagonist starts. Somebody get the boy some potions. We get introduced to a new character, Yellow, who has the ability to read Pokemon's minds and heal them. He's oddly obsessed with finding Red for a character we've never met before, but don't worry, that's all cleared up in later volumes. From here, what starts as a simple mystery slowly turns into the moral conundrum I was talking about earlier. We find out that the Elite Four is plotting to rid the world of humans apart from a select few powerful trainers, because deforestation and power plants are poisoning Pokemon and leaving them without homes. They truly believe the world would be better off without humans. I mean, it's kind of relatable. We get tragedy stricken flashbacks involving Lorelei trying to save her dying dugong and Lance witnessing the destruction of his hometown through industrialization. And the first part of their plan was to get rid of the trainer most likely to stop them. That being our good friend Red. They reveal their plan is to use an amplified version of the Team Rocket device with the gym badges from part one to summon a monstrosity of a Pokemon to wipe out humanity. Why do bad guys always reveal their plans? We get treated to some intense battles of the Elite Four versus everyone else that includes the gym leaders of justice, Team Rocket, who have decided that working together to stop the end of the world as they know it is probably a good idea, and our trainers. Green loses her arm, poor Arbok can't catch a break, and all this builds until Lance releases this unknown Pokemon, who does have some slightly familiar visual traits, that is literally massive to destroy the human world. But using the power of Viridian Forest and the power of friendship, our team manages to escape using the first Z-move and Megavolt the creature. They transform the powers of destruction into the powers of life, and in doing so, our main story is finished in a pretty satisfying way. The bad guys lost, Team Rocket vowed to disband and work on becoming stronger individuals. The powers of life that were released are enabling plant life to grow in places that hasn't been seen in many years. And our main characters all start new paths towards improving themselves and the world around them. Yay, we learned something. It leaves you with this feeling of fulfillment, like you accomplished something, even though realistically, you've just been sitting on your bed reading picture books for four days. Now, obviously I've missed out the answers to many questions you've probably got right now, but I feel like if I explained everything, then I'd be sucking all of the fun out of reading it for yourselves. And now that I've spent the last however long simping over the series, it's only fair that we talk about the points that weren't so enjoyable. And while there are plenty of people out there who have studied the art of storytelling, as your average viewer, my only real gripe with the series is yellow or at a minimum, the way the character was introduced. Over half the series relies on Yellow carrying the story in the end, and so it is simply disappointing that Yellow isn't as competent a trainer as Red. You spend the first three stories with your protagonist as a trainer that actively learns from his mistakes, and in general, is pretty adept. I mean, the first story with the Bulbasaur is a great example of how Red overcomes the obstacles that plague him in general. He evolves his Pokemon, builds a strong team, and you really root for him. On the other hand, you then get Yellow plonked in your lap. A very much young child, who acts like a young child, who is constantly hitting the cancel button on the evolution of his Pokemon. He literally cries when his Rattata evolves into a Raticate. His naivety is grating in comparison to the characters we've dealt with so far. And it, he doesn't appear to have a reason for acting this way other than he doesn't want to. He's soft. It feels like if part one and part two have protagonists that are written for two different age demographics. In fact, I realized while writing this that my main problem with Yellow is that he doesn't feel real. The trick to a great protagonist is relatability. Do they make the same or similar decisions as yourself if you were put in the same or similar positions? Sorry, Yellow, but no. <laughs> I cannot relate to at least half the decisions you choose to make. The violence of the manga shows that the demographic isn't for young children, but Yellow feels like the protagonist of a child's story. 
This conflict of interest left myself as a reader with a real sense of loss for Red as our protagonist and an infuriating sense that we weren't getting him back sooner. But thinking about it, isn't that how all of our characters would be feeling anyway? And in that way, is making us feel like how the rest of the cast feel just clever writing? And so while Yellow manages to get through the obstacles at hand with his powers and luck until we've really hit crunch time, his personality can make the beginning two volumes of the Yellow chapters a challenge to get through. Thank God it's manga and you can power through them in an evening. In the end, we're only left with the open question of what happened to Green. Who is that Pokemon who looks oddly like Ho-Oh that kidnapped her? Why did this happen to her? But we're left with the promise of exploring Green's trauma more and an introduction to Silver in the Johto region, an acknowledgement that the series will continue. If you're a fan of the Pokemon franchise, I would be surprised if you weren't a fan of the manga. As a Poketuber, I semi-oftenly, probably not as much as I should, react to the Pokemon anime episodes. And a comment I find myself making more than I want to is that I wanted more from the episode, but I didn't get more from the episode, and I'm not surprised at that. Did I hope for more? Yes. But did I expect to get more? No. In that regard, this series ends up feeling like an expanded Twilight Wings from a different generation. The art is beautiful, and the world is explored with meaning and a heartfelt gratitude for the games and the impact that they had on the creators and the fan base in general. In our first message from the writer, he says, I always had one goal in mind, to express in manga form the surprise and wonder that one feels while playing the Pokemon games. And to that I say, mission accomplished. Hey guys, it's Tofu. I just wanted to say real quick, thanks for watching. There are so many things I left out of this video because I couldn't find a way to fit them in. And obviously a load of things I left either pretty vague or unanswered. So more than anything, I hope that that encourages yourself to go and pick up the manga sometime or read it for free online. And as this is the first video in a series, I'd love to get some feedback from you guys. Is there anything in particular you did or didn't like and why? Just cause if I'm making this a series, I don't want to be doing something that people don't like over and over again, like from the start. <laughs> but I hope that you enjoyed this video and I hope that everybody is staying safe and healthy in the real world. And I'll see you next time. Take care guys, bye.